When I was very small, I wanted to be a judge because my grandfather was a judge. Uh, but I think as I grew up, I started studying economics at school and I found that really fascinating and I ended up studying it at university and I became very interested in businesses and how they operate. And then I, it was sort of inevitable, I think, really, that from economics as a degree, I went into the city um, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was the most exciting kind of fast paced environment. I was analyzing companies and studying businesses, which is exactly what I found fascinating. And I did that for nine years and I had quite a successful career at Credit Suisse and I worked at Goldman Sachs and then I worked at a hedge fund. Um, and then something changed in my mid to late twenties. I started thinking that actually this, <laughs> I couldn't see myself being a city girl for the rest of my life. and. I started to find it slightly empty, I think, and I, f I was conscious that I wasn't, I didn't really feel I was creating something. So I started to get interested in maybe I should actually branch out on my own and do my own thing. And, and actually, probably fundamentally, I actually had never thought of myself as an entrepreneur running my own business, partly because both my father and my brother had run their own businesses and I'd seen the stress that comes with running your own business and you know you're always the last person to get paid at the, <laughs> at the end of the day and you know there's just so much resting on you and uh, and all that sort of thing and and yet it started to become something that I just got this itch that I really wanted to do it. I think my childhood self would find it very surprising um, that I run a business that makes detergents and um, and repairs and alters clothes, partly because I can't repair and alter clothes myself and I've never been able to sew. But that was part of the reason for starting the business. It was because, you know, I'm like so many other people in this country that, you know, we just don't have those skills. So that was sort of what what incentivized me in the first place, I guess, to, to start Clothes Doctor. But it's certainly I would never have imagined when I was a kid that this is what I would be doing now. I see the future of the brand as being global. Um, I definitely think that it has enormous potential to grow. I mean, it, it's, it's very much, I think, what people are looking for today. I think, you know, you look at brands that are 15, 20, 30 years old, and they just seem so outdated now. You know, they don't, they're not modern in how they in the types of materials they use, in the types of ingredients they use. And I think that today's consumer is looking for something different. And I think that I don't expect us to be, you know, a, a mainstream brand like Daz in every country in the world. But I think that there is a significant market for us all over the place. And I think we're not limited also to the detergent industry you know we can we have all these different areas that we can go into we're launching repair products as well and all kinds of other care products and i think that there's just huge opportunity to expand across categories as well as to grow into new markets as well i think that um, my confidence in our ability to go global has really been driven by what I've seen over the last 12 months. The products have been incredibly successful and I have just been really blown away by the interest from other markets and other geographies. So for example, we've just launched with a huge company to a partnership with a huge company in Australia and New Zealand. So now, you know, our products are everywhere in Australia and New Zealand. And that's just, I, I mean, I just couldn't have imagined that 12 months ago. And so if we can do that there, then why can't we do that everywhere? <laughs> I became interested in the repair industry, I think, partly because I became increasingly conscious that the fashion industry is incredibly linear, or at least when I started to look at it back in 2016, it was, I think it, I mean, it still is. Um, but there is very limited uh, scope for actually reusing clothes, repairing clothes, and the traditional repairs and alterations companies that you see like the the little shops on the corner and things like that generally I think it's fair to say wouldn't don't provide 
the most amazing service and um, they're not very convenient to use. Um, and so I became interested really as if we could provide a really high quality repair service, is there a way we could actually encourage people to you know, reuse their clothes, use their clothes for longer, extend the life of what they have. Um, and so yeah, I guess it was in response to um, my understanding of the fashion industry and, and how much waste is created by fashion and how much, you know, how many clothes go into landfill every year. Um, that was really the, the kind of trigger for getting interested. I think that everybody has different areas that really interest them. I, I think, you know, we are increasingly conscious of all these issues. I think for me personally, the bit that really um, sort of touches me or, uh, you know, that I am very aware of is waste. And I don't know if it's partly because my, my, um, my father kind of grew up in the war and my parents have this kind of post-war attitude slightly, which is that you don't waste anything, you know, no food goes to waste. You look after your clothes, you repair everything you've got. You know, they're very, very careful with their possessions. And I guess I grew up with that same mindset. Um, but then also you kind of, when, when I was 18, I kind of got thrust into this fast fashion world where, you know, everyone was, when I was at university, everyone was going off to Primark to, you know, my, my guy friends were going off to Primark to just buy new boxer shorts and throw the old ones away because they couldn't be bothered to do their laundry. You know, it was this sort of extreme dichotomy from what I'd grown up with to then what I suddenly saw happening. Um, and, you know, and I, I did, I was a big fast fashion shopper for a while. Um, and I did have a huge number of clothes in my wardrobe. And then I kind of started to get this realization that I actually, I, I couldn't throw those clothes away. I had this kind of instinctive feeling that I just couldn't do that. And I knew that if I sent them to a charity shop, they'd probably end up in landfill anyway. So then that was when, that was when it really clicked. You know, my wardrobe was sort of bursting at the seams and I <laughs> didn't have anywhere to put anything. When I started Clothes Doctor, I advertised in the local paper for seamstresses in my home county, which is Cornwall. Um, and I found two really, really good people who came on board. One of them is still with us and is our, um, our warehouse manager actually today. Um, and I actually learned a lot from them because we were, we were kind of working on solving this problem together. We were trying to make repairs work online you know, something that had never been done remotely before we were trying to do remotely. So we were working on, you know, how do you communicate with customers? You receive, um, you receive the items and then you have to, you know, you have to know exactly what needs to be done. And then, you know, you do the repair, you take payments. So we were kind of working through this whole process together um, and they were fantastic. And I, I honestly, I learned so much from them about how things actually get repaired and how to do things, you know, visible mending and all kinds of things like that, which was really fascinating. Um, and then as time went on, we slightly changed the model a bit. Um, and, and then actually when COVID happened, we moved from everyone being in a workshop mending in one place to everyone working from home for obvious reasons. Um, and it worked really well. And we actually found that um, sort of having it slightly decentralized made a lot of sense and people were much happier working or were very happy working in their studios at home. Um, and so that's how the business has, has grown now. So it's more of a network now. Um, but still, I mean, we, we started an apprenticeship program um, back in 2018 and we were hiring basically people who had potentially no or very few skills. Um, I don't know how much you know about Cornwall, but it's a very, um, it's a very poor part of the country. It's actually the poorest county in, in the UK um, and one of the poorest places in Europe actually as well. Um, and there's a lot of uh, underemployment, unemployment, youth unemployment in particular. Um, and so I started the scheme, which was the intention was to train people in mending. And um, we put a, a, an advert out for one position and I think we had 150 applicants or something and we narrowed it down to about 20 people and um, and we got them into a room and um, gave them all some things to try out you know to, to mend something and 
And basically we were just looking for people who were good with their hands and who had kind of natural abilities. Um, and we ended up hiring two people from that. And one of them is now our, I mean, best, best seamstress who was actually here on Monday. She's amazing. And she trained up from scratch with Clothes Doctor and she'd never, she'd never, she'd never mended anything before she came to us. I think as time has gone on with Clothes Doctor, I have realised that there's this, um, there's this constant challenge where when clothes are manufactured in the Far East or, you know, a long way away, um, they can be manufactured incredibly cheaply and, you know, they can be sold by fast fashion companies for very, very low prices. And yet, if you're getting something repaired in the UK, there will always be a cost involved with a, a, a skill, you know, it's an artisanal skill and people need to be paid a fair wage to, to do that skill. Um, and so I think I realised that actually we ended, we, we have, in some ways, we have become a sort of a more premium service and we're offering repairs to people who have more expensive garments you know, if you if you spent four hundred pounds on a dress, you will have you may be happy to spend fifty pounds to repair that dress. If you spent ten pounds on the dress, you're not going to spend fifty pounds to repair it. And so, I think you're self-selecting the 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 more expensive garments, the people who spend more on their wardrobe. And I think what I wanted to do by introducing the tutorials and the repair videos was to make it much more accessible to everybody because I think you know this issue is particularly pronounced at the <laughs> at the fast fashion end of the industry and so giving people the ability to actually repair themselves allows them to also participate in the in the repair revolution with the repair services we would often find that people would send things into us and then they wanted advice on how to look after them or what did they do wrong or you know why has this happened to this garment and so it became this thing where I just thought, you know, if we could add some of these, you know, add some products in, we could offer people things that will actually help them to look after the, the, the garments at home after, the, you know, after they've had it repaired, you know, you can now wash it in this to make sure that the moths stay away, you know, you can do the following. And so it became a sort of very niche line. I mean, we were literally pouring the detergents into bottles in our workshop and screwing on the lid and then we would put them in the basket with you know the items that were going back to the customer that was how it started I mean really really small scale um, and then we found that it was really popular and they started to grow even faster than the repair services and so actually I thought you know well I should probably expand this a bit so I, I found partners UK-based partners who could help us make it on a slightly larger scale. Our first product must have been the Signature Wash, um, which is the number two wash in our range, which is a really nice everyday detergent, which would make sense. Um, and then the Cashmere Wash as well, because that was a really obvious one. We had so much knitwear coming into us and Autumn, winter is a really big season for us because everybody gets their jumpers out and finds holes and, um, and sends them off. So it became the next step. The obvious step was to, to create a really nice wash for knitwear. I think it definitely gave us an advantage that we had really good relationships with our customers already. So we could actually get, you know, hear what they wanted and hear what was missing in the market. Our next products, we've got four really lovely sprays coming out shortly which so up until now as you can you may be able to imagine but we work with only plastic free um, materials and so working we we spent a long time sorting out the packaging and working out what would what works best and we came up with these aluminium bottles um, and actually that was the that was a very large part of our initial product development now that we have those you know it obviously makes it easier to then produce new lines but we're now for the first time introducing products that actually use atomizers because you know a spray head is a whole different 
ball game from the original um, pouring detergent that we had. Um, so we have spent a long time developing that and now we've got that we can really we can start producing sprays um, and so we've got a really lovely steamer spray coming out. Um, we've got a deodorizing spray um, we've got we've got two knitwear sprays as well because we couldn't decide which fragrance we preferred so we did both of them. Um, so those are coming out in the next two months which is really exciting. I think actually the 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 perfume is the probably for us it's the most important part or it's one of the very important parts of um, of the product and we've spent a lot of time and energy in finding the exact fragrances that we really love. It's the bit that the consumer can really feel an emotional reaction, an emotional attachment to, if that makes sense. I think you know, you, you, you obviously, if you're buying a detergent, you assume the detergent works and, um, and our detergents work amazingly well. Smells and fragrances, they just, they, they create, I think they touch you on a very, a very much deeper level than, you know, the practicalities of, of, you know, the detergent being great at, you know, getting rid of, um, getting rid of stains and things like that. You know our detergents do that and we've spent a long time making sure that they work incredibly well but but for me and and probably as from a personal point of view as well the bit that i really love is the fragrances to be honest we we actually when we started on the products we found a really tiny perfume house um i think they were in lancashire and we worked with them for about a year um and they were really lovely people but it was it was pretty much actually just one guy on his own and um and then when we expanded and we needed to produce in larger quantities they couldn't actually fulfill they couldn't give us enough of what we needed so then when i did our first proper manufacturing run um which was only actually a year ago um i was completely stumped and i had to go out and and try and find someone uh, a new perfumer that I could work with and I did quite a bit of research and I spoke to kind of contacts and this one guy put me in touch with our perfumer and he has he actually put him in touch with me he got in touch with me said that you know he had a look at the website and thought the brand looked amazing and would love to work with me on it and we've worked together ever since I think for us, so we use a very high proportion of natural essential oils in our fragrances, which is quite unusual because for, for most mainstream brands, they're far too expensive um, and um, they're complex. Natural ingredients, natural fragrances are, you know, they're, they're taken from the plants. So they have a, a much more complex set of natural chemicals in them and things like that. So they can be less predictable. And so I think for, you know, for these, you know, huge corporations that are producing billions of, you know, um, bottles every year, it's probably too, uh, it's too unpredictable for them. But for us, it works really well. And so when we look at a new, when we're doing and producing a new product, or working on product development, we will try to think of fragrances that actually have, um, some active effect as well if that makes sense so for example with with our um with our cashmere wash we actually use essential oils that also repel moths so it's a it's a combination we want to obviously find something that smells absolutely you know amazing but we also want to find something that that can actually benefit have a have a, a sort of knock-on benefit um, in the, the care and the long-term sort of um, storage of the garment as well. I think my favourite is the sports wash, actually, which is, um, it's this incredibly kind of fresh, zingy, it smells like lemon sherbet, and it's just so different for a detergent that you, I, I mean, I've never smelled anything like it before, and I just absolutely love it, and it just, you know, really wakes you up. <laughs> I started off, as I mentioned before, I can't sew. So there was, there was one thing that I really needed help with right from the beginning. Um, so, you know, we hired our seamstresses right at the start. Um, 
but a lot of the rest of the work I was doing myself for actually probably the first three years. Um, and then I started to, I mean, first of all, we kind of, we got to the size where it made sense that, you know, I could afford to have more people and things like that. But also I, I, I think what's incredibly challenging at the beginning of a company is actually working out who you need and what the role, you know, needs to look like. And it wasn't until I was experienced enough to understand that, that I could actually hire the right people. And now I think we have, we are literally just getting to the stage now where we have a really well staffed team. And I am very much moving from being a, a sort of doer of everything where everything comes through me to being um, someone sitting in the middle trying to help, but actually there are team leaders in every area now, which is just an amazing feeling to have come from, you know, me scrabbling around just trying to get stuff done to actually feeling that there's a really, really solid team. I think the, the feeling of when you find the right person, you know, you know, you know when it's right and you know that you can trust that person to, you know, love your brand and nurture your brand in the same way that you do. I think honestly, I actually never, I never, I never really wanted to be the face of the brand. I never really wanted to be in front of the brand. I always saw myself as someone behind the brand, if that makes sense. And I, and I, I love how the brand looks and I, you know, and it's obviously, it's my baby, but um, I've always wanted it to kind of stand out there on its own and I've wanted to be hidden <laughs> behind it. Um, and so in a way, finding those people who, who, you know, who are there and who can push it forward with me um, has just been such a, uh, you know, and it feels like a huge achievement actually, probably my biggest achievement I'd say out of everything in, in Clothes Doctor so far is the team that we have today. As it stands today, the team is perfect. The team is the perfect size and, you know, and I'm super happy with it. Um, I think there will be, as, as our growth continues, which I'm very confident about, I think there are some obvious things where we will need to make hires. So for example, having someone, at the moment, for example, I do all our product development um, with the help of our perfumer and, you know, and, and a few people who aren't within the company, but who I work um, alongside. And that is an obvious place where you know, as time goes on, we'll be hopefully producing more and more and we will we will get behind if I don't have someone working in product development alongside me. Um, I think as we expand, you know, we're finding increasingly that we're dealing a lot with exports and going to other countries. And I think that could be another place where, you know, we're going to need to have more help um, helping us in particular with like the logistics of exporting and things like that. Right now it's perfect, but ask me again in a year and I think we'll probably be a few more heads in the team.